ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له اشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الى يوم الدين اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته there is no doubt that as Muslims we feel the pain of other Muslims or we should because the Prophet والسلام, has informed us that this ummah is like one body and if one part of the body is experiencing any type of pain then the entire body responds with sleeplessness and fever. So any part of this ummah that suffers, especially when it suffers as publicly as our brothers and sisters have suffered in Gaza from the genocide that is currently still ongoing, and we ask Allah to aid them and to give them victory, we, we feel that pain. And sometimes a person may feel some level of fatigue and even helplessness because of the distance. And we feel like we don't have any strength and there's nothing that we can do about it. And despair can set in. And I, and I acknowledge those emotions and I'm sure that just from a, on a human level, maybe all of us have at some point or another felt something like that in the last few months. So what I'd like to discuss today, inshallah ta'ala, there's a way forward. What, what do we do now? And I don't want to look at that just from a, an individual level, because I think we have a communal responsibility as well. But I'll start with the individual things that we can do, inshallah, and then move into where we are as a community. And first and foremost, just to establish that we do have a responsibility. And the greater one's privilege is, the greater one's responsibility becomes. And we as American Muslims have a unique responsibility to respond and to act because it is our government that is aiding this genocide. We're the subjects, we live here. We do have a voice. Our voice is not as amplified as we would like it to be. It's not as strong, it's not as influential as we would like it to be, but we do have a voice. We have to build on that. And because of that, we have a responsibility to give a voice to the voiceless and to amplify the situation as much as possible. The Prophet ﷺ said in no uncertain terms, من من This is each and every single Muslim, whoever from amongst you sees an evil, let him change that with his hand. Do something about it with your hand. <laughs> now, that's, that's the first level. That's actually an obligation. However, if you do not have the ability to do that, then you move on to the next level. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, <laughs> The person who can't do something with his hand, he can't stop it. There's nothing that you can do physically, for example. Then say something. Change it with your tongue. Here's the issue. And I'm, I'm going to stop here for a second. What does that look like under the current situation? Sometimes that literally means, and it has meant, for some of our brothers and sisters here in America, that you're going to lose your job. You spoke up. It, it could not be silent. The evil was overwhelming and, and it required 
it required a response. And I'm not saying that we need to act hastily or you know, take other things into consideration, all of that, but we have to have courage. This is, this is not a time to show cowardice. And the Prophet ﷺ used to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of every salat from being a coward. And at other times. And so uh, oftentimes we fail at this point which is change it with your tongue, say something. And the reason we fail is because we start to think that what are the consequences of saying something? And so if it looks like it might be a little too difficult, then we don't say anything. But the Prophet Sallallahu did not promise that it was going to be easy. If you see something that is wrong, then you need to say something. Now, again, there are rules and regulations for these type of things, but I'm, I'm trying to lay out a broad understanding that oftentimes we may not speak up because it's difficult, but that's it, it, nobody promised you ease. And the difficulty that the Prophet ﷺ went through and spoke up was not something that we would expect to go through in our lifetimes. And if we think it's difficult to speak up, don't we think it's difficult to watch our brothers and sisters pulling their own children out the rubble? I mean, is it is that what we're looking at because we speak up? Right. So. Think about that now. Well, the person who doesn't have the ability to say anything. Perhaps the repercussions are just overwhelming. It's nothing I can say at the present time. Or I don't even know how to respond to that, for example. Fabi qalbi. The Prophet ﷺ said, then what? Then at least recognize it in the heart. Hate it in your heart. Change it in your heart. And that is the weakest of faith. Meaning that after that, there is no iman. Now, there's a, a portion, many of you have heard this hadith, but there's a part about this, this last statement of the Prophet Sallallahu that many of us miss or we overlook. He says, the hated in your heart. What happens when you actually are recognizing that there is evil? Even if you can't, even if you can't do anything about it with your hand or you can't say something with your tongue, if it remains something that you don't like in your heart, then eventually what's going to happen, you're going to say something or do something. And so it's going to lead. So we can't become apathetic. We can't act like it's not happening. Shut it out. I, I do agree that sometimes there's an overindulgence in looking at graphic images and these type of things. That is not something that was common until the very recent uh, present because it just, it, you couldn't watch this type of stuff in real time. Nobody in the past was watching war constantly. And it, it has a very bad psychological effect. And so sometimes you're going to have to unplug. That's true. But that doesn't take away from the fact that you are, that you are hating it in your heart. So with that, I do want to establish that we, we, we have a responsibility. And that as American Muslims, because of, the, of where we live, because of who our government is and their role in this genocide, then we do also have a unique responsibility that goes beyond the Muslims of the West. Now, this is a uniquely and I'm, I'm, I'm saying Muslims all over the world have a responsibility, but we have a unique responsibility. And so on an individual level, one of the things that we need to do, each and every single one of us, is to remain optimistic. Now, this might sound like, what, what does that mean? What do I do? Do not despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember 
many years ago, a brother said to me, just telling him, let's let's pray. He said, I'm not, I'm not praying. What do you mean? He said, I've done too many things. We're going to hell anyway. Think about that. What, what, what just happened? If Shaitan convinces a person that there's no hope and they give up hope, then at that point they stop working towards anything. And so there is a group that wants you to think that they're so powerful, that they have so much money, that their lobby is so strong, that so that we what that we feel like we are no match. And so we give up and we don't even try. But Allah is more mighty and richer and greater and more magnificent than anything that they have. And this is why evil thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his ability is the worst sin that a person can commit. It's actually what leads to shirk. This is why Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala said, Wa a'adham al-zunubi inda Allah isa'atu dhanni bihi. That the greatest of sins in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal is to have evil thoughts about Allah. Pessimism comes from that, those evil thoughts. To think that Allah can't do. We, we have to remain optimistic. That is, that is an individual, each and every one of us as an individual. And I will talk about what that looks like on a communal level, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. In a minute, inshallah. Next. We have to overcome our own selfishness. Uh, many of us, without even realizing it, have adopted American individualism. Individualism is a religion. It is, it is the religion of America that is, permeates their education system, their entertainment system, and everything else. Where we only think about ourselves and our own comfort and all of these things. Overcoming that and working on the nafs is critical. It has to be canceled. What does that look like? Well, oftentimes we isolate ourselves and it is at that time that shaitan overcomes us. The Prophet he says, The Prophet said, there are not three people who live in a village, or who live out in the desert. And they don't establish the salat amongst themselves, yani, that they pray together, except that shaitan has overcome them. Why? It's not because they're not praying. It's because they're not praying together. They're not establishing community. Everybody is doing their own thing. And we've adopted that mentality. It, as the Muslim community has grown here in America, many of us have unfortunately fallen into that, and it used to be different. It used to be different. The Prophet said, He says, So be with the Jama'ah, be together, because the wolf eats the lone sheep. As we move forward as a community, again, this is what we're talking about, too. We talk about how do we, what, what is our responsibility? What can we do? We have to strengthen what we have in order to be effective. And alhamdulillah, we have been effective to a degree. But with some organization and some minor tweaking, we can be much more effective. We can be much more effective. So, Overcoming, overcoming this individualism, being optimistic, amplifying the voice of the voiceless. And this is everybody's responsibility. And I will say, subhanAllah, one of the most effective ways 
is to show the human side of this conflict. All of you have probably watched some of these proceedings dealing with genocide and have looked at the part of part of what they do to as the step towards genocide is to dehumanize the other side. And in the beginning, subhanAllah, for weeks, all you saw was these people are hostages. These people lost their families. Uh, these people are waiting for their father to come home and all of this on one side and absolutely crickets on the other side. Just numbers, but no human side to it. Amplifying the human side of it is critical because you want to give them a voice. You know, side story, I'm, I was riding down a highway in Philadelphia and over, there was a sign hanging over the, the bridge, right? And the sign said something along the lines of ceasefire now. Uh, and there was some other verbiage, but it was real quick messaging, real strong. Ceasefire now, peace, this type of thing. And anyway, so my, my route took me that way. And who was it? It was a, a group of 200 Jews. 200 Jews. And they had the, the film crew out there, like the, uh, the, the news, the local news and all of this. So they interviewed one lady. And she said, that we will do what, listen to this. We will do whatever it takes for however long it takes until there's peace. And I, I thought, subhanAllah, that's sabr. Like that's real sabr. And she meant every word of what she said. We will do whatever it takes for however long it takes. There's no end game. There's no, we're going to be here for a month, for two months, for however long it takes. I'm committed to this. Jews, subhanAllah, their voice needs to be amplified. Just like we show that human side of the Palestinians who are being killed, amplifying the voice is a very strategic and strong move even when you're dealing with other people and you're communicating with them, which is also something that we should be doing as we amplify this voice, to show them what American Jews are saying, what other Israelis are saying against the genocide, use their voices. Because now we've cut out the bias. Oh, you're just saying that because you're Muslim. You're just saying that. No, here, here are objective facts. And so this is important. Obviously, it's time to make a lot of du'a and to continue to make du'a and not to get tired of making du'a. SubhanAllah, you don't know. Many of us, we, we make du'a for certain things and because we don't know how Allah is answering that du'a, we, uh, we may get frustrated and leave off du'a on an individual level. Just subhanAllah, if you just stayed in sujood, one sajda in each salat, just a little bit longer, Allah Mansur Ikhwan and Afiyasa, for example. Just increase your sujood just a little bit. The reward comes back to you, and Allah Azza wa Jal answers dua. Now, the last thing that I'm going to talk about on this part, and I'm going to move to a communal what we need to be doing be in the night or some of the things that we can be doing is we actually have to shift priorities individually. Many of us are afraid to take action on certain things because we're too comfortable. We're not ready to sacrifice. We're not ready to give up certain things. And for that reason, we lag behind. And our Prophet ﷺ warned us about this. Well, 
Kutibalah. Whoever's main concern is this dunya, Allah Azza wa Jalla is going to scatter his affairs. What does that mean? Your, your affairs are scattered. You ever, you ever heard somebody say, My heart is torn between this and that? Trying to please too many different entities at the same time. That's what the dunya is. The dunya is not just one thing, the dunya is multiple things pulling you in different directions. And so whoever's main concern is the dunya, then he's going to be pulled in different directions. Notice the, also the word hum is also the word they use for anxiety. And so you hear people all the time suffering from anxiety because the dunya, you're worried about dunya. So you're going to be anxious all the time. It's going to be a chronic thing that sticks. Farraq Allahu shamla. It's going to be all over the place. All he can see and all he can think about is not being broke. I don't want to be poor. So you work more, you do this more, you invest here, haram, not haram, whatever, just make it work. Do whatever. Because I'm scared to be broke. I'm scared to be poor. I'm scared that my family won't have. How can I give this for Islam? How can I do jihad with my wealth? And I got to take care of all these other things. And I've literally heard people with $2 million sitting on the side, literally, saying, I, I, I'm, I'm just not financially stable. It's, a, it's an attitude. Jahlal faqra bayna aynay. Muslims, I'm saying. Walam yatihi min dunya illa ma kutiba lah. And the only thing that's going to come to him from the dunya was, was already written for him anyway. If we make this shift individually, it's going to have a communal effect. Whoever's concern, main concern, the thing that occupies his mind is the hereafter. His affairs are going to be consolidated. Why? Because he only has one objective, to please Allah. Drink this water. Is that pleasing to Allah? Well, if it's Ramadan and it's the daytime, it's not. So we're not going to do it. Every move that you make is about pleasing Allah. Khalas. Khalas. Jama'a Allahu shamla. Wa ja'ala ghinahu fi qalbihi. He becomes rich in his heart. He's content with what he has. Strives for, for more. Content with what he has. And the dunya is going to come to him despite that. Despite the fact that he's not chasing after the dunya. The dunya is going to come to him. This is a mind shift. This is an individual shift that we have to make that will have a great impact on the Muslims in this country. And this is the point that I actually want to get to and deal with for the rest of this conversation, inshallah. Ta'ala. All of that was kind of like a warm up. What is our issue? What can we do when we think about Gaza right now? The answer that we all have to admit is that we're really not in position to do much more than what I've already said. Yeah, you can go out. You can protest different ways. And sometimes protests lead to, uh, you read the history of America, subhanAllah, Rosa Parks, when she was sitting down on the chair, I'm sure at that time she wasn't thinking about a movement being built around the fact that she just was tired. She's not getting up. But it, that, was the, that was the moment that sparked a movement. So yes, sometimes there are these little things that a person can do that lead to much greater efforts. But if, again, if we're looking at it from our perspective, there really isn't much more we can do right now. But you know what we can do right now? We can start preparing for the future. And what does that look like? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. <clears throat> How many of you, uh, the older people have children, how, how many of you are concerned about your children being Muslim? Like you, you, you want your children to be Muslim and you're concerned about that. Like you think about that a lot. Yeah? Okay. Good. How many of you think about how your children 
will lead society in the next generation. Okay, hold on. I, I just need to, I need to run some data in my head. Okay, okay, okay. Start over. How, man, I need the hands to go kind of like up high. Uh, one second, one second. How many of you, like what you think about is how can I help my children to stay on Islam? So, for example, just the, but wait, don't wait. Um, put them in, Muslim, in Islamic school, put them in tahfid, make sure that they have some Muslim friends here and there, right? Okay, how, how many of us are right there? Okay, good. Good, okay. All right, great. Okay, let me put them there. How many of you think, like, in a, in a different way, how can I put my children in position to lead America? MashaAllah, this is great. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Did you just think about that when I said it, or are you already thinking about it before? Huh? Okay. MashaAllah. So what, what it is super important for us here, those of us who choose and will stay here in the United States of America, it is important that we begin a shift in our questioning and in our aspirations. I'll say that again. It's just thinking different. That's where it starts. All voluntary actions start with thoughts. You have to have the idea and then you move on that. Right now, most of us, and I, I'm just telling you, alhamdulillah, this was a great number of hands I saw go up here, and, and I believe you. I just don't believe that that's the sentiment of the majority of us, right? Which is, our goal has become, how do we save Islam? How do I make sure that my kids are Muslim? It's a good, that's a good goal to have. But we're shooting low. It's a low aspiration. The Muslims, Allah Azawajal has given us the pieces that we need to lead. We have to, we have to think a little differently. We have to move a little differently. But we have revelation. We have the Quran. The unadulterated word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have the supreme guidance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And yet... The language that we've used since 9-11 has been, we just want to be treated equally. Hmm? I heard that, right? We want to be accepted by society. It's the language that we use. What about that shift to say, no, wait a minute. We're going to, how do we build the institutions that give us and give the next generation of Muslims the tools that they need to be leaders of society. To be in a position where we are influencing the morality of society, culture in some way, politics in some way, or otherwise. It's, it's a different question. And if we ask ourselves, those different questions, right? We're going to move differently. Like when you build a factory to build a Toyota Corolla, it's a different factory than the one you do for a Tesla. No offense to Corollas, I actually had one. So when we're building schools so that our kids can stay Muslim, there's a way we build those. When we establish programs, so that our kids can be good Muslims, which we want. It's a different type of program than being a good Muslim who leads others. And I'm saying that as a community, we have that responsibility. The Prophet Wasallam, his teachings indicate to us to aim high. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Amin Abillahi wa Rasul. وقام الصلاة وصام رمضان كان حقا عليك 
أن يدخله الله الجنة سبحان الله Whoever believes in Allah and his messenger establishes the salah, fasts the month of Ramadan, Allah has made it a duty upon himself to enter that person into Jannah. Jahada fi sabilillah, o jalasa fi ardihi allati wulida fiha. Whether he goes out, and engages in jihad for the sake of Allah, or he stays in the land in which he was born. Everybody heard that? Some of the companions heard that, and they were like, wait a minute. We go to Jannah, even if we just stay here? They say, Ya Rasulullah, O oh Messenger of Allah, should we go out and like give the glad tidings to the people? Let them know, like, the Prophet وسلم, said in some narrations, let the people work. The Prophet said, let the people work. Because Jannah has a hundred levels that Allah has prepared for those mujahideen and his cause, who strive for his cause. Between the levels, between each level is like what's between the heavens and the earth. So if you ask Allah, Ask him for what? The lower level? The middle? Jannah is Jannah, mashallah. If you get in, alhamdulillah. But the Prophet said, what? Ask Allah for al-firdos because it's the best part of Jannah and it's the highest part. And this comes throughout the teachings of the Prophet to have a himma aliyah that we aspire for greatness. And though I believe and I have seen on an individual level, mashallah, people that shoot for that. And many of us, when it comes to dunya, shoot for that. You will find a father who tells his son, you're not just going to be a doctor, you're going to be a surgeon. You're going to be a top surgeon. You're going to be a consultant. You're going to be a neuro, right? Don't, you're not just going to be a doctor. Uh, you're going to be what? But as a community, is that our language? Is that the language that we're using? I can tell you with some level of confidence from board level, from, from boardrooms on down, we're not, if, if it is being talked about, it's not being talked about enough. High aspirations. Rabi'ah ibn Ka'b al aslami radiallahu anhu. Hmm? Oh, wow. SubhanAllah. Get the dunya. All right. Well, since we got a couple of minutes, just say radiallahu anhu for Rabi'a ibn Ka'b and we got to move on. The point here is that there's so many other aspects, so many other teachings of the Prophet والسلام, that encourage us to aim high. There's a narration on Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu where he says, لا تصغيرن همتك Don't Diminish your aspirations. Don't, don't shoot low. A, a lot of us, we don't dream big because we, we're scared to fail. So, so what? Like, if, if you tried, person wanted to make hijrah and he's trying to make hijrah and he can't. His reward is with Allah. So, so, Pushing yourself and as a community, communally looking to do things at a higher level is really important. Don't diminish your aspirations. Don't, don't have low aspirations. I haven't seen anything, he says, more crippling. Then low ambition. Just, 
don't even try. And I am saying, I want you to understand, how does this relate to what we're talking about? What, what are we supposed to do? What we're supposed to do is raise our level. It's a long-term project, but things can change 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line. We put ourselves in position where now it's not just so easy to dismiss the Muslim voice. We're in different positions. And alhamdulillah, we've come a long way as a community in terms of build, building our infrastructure, the numbers that we have, the diversity that we have as a community, overcoming several of our barriers. We've come a long way, but there's still a long way to go. We still have a generational obligation to raise that bar. And that will make a difference for Muslims globally because the world as it stands, and it is what it is. We, you, you don't control what people think. The world, until today, a poll that came out three days ago, views America as a stabilizing force for peace in the world. La ilaha illallah. But it is what it is. Now, so that being the case, and what America is as a global power, we have to put ourselves in position to have some level of influence. And we can, we can. Wallahi, what we do as a community should make us so proud. I know all that sometimes we focus on the negative, but the fact, think about it like this. Think about all of the misogyny in America, right? 4,000 or whatever misogyny we have. All of these, does this place have a mortgage? Nah. Almost all of the misogyny that we had, they owned outright, mashallah. And you go around to the churches, these mega churches and these other places, now they're carrying notes for a long time. We put our money together. We're not getting these grants that they're getting. We're not getting backing from any government agencies or otherwise. And Allah Azawajal has blessed us with these little means that we have to come together because somebody was dreaming big and said, nah, we can do this. And we will, inshallah. Thank you. I don't only got a couple minutes. I want to end with this ayah. This ayah from Surah al Anfam is, is what we have to do individually and communally. Allah says, Allah tells us, and this is a command, prepare for them what you can, of strength, of force, of cavalry, for what purpose? This is a sound bite, by the way. I know just translating it, somebody's going to put it on the internet, I'm going to be a terrorist. So that you can inf inflict terror, or uh, instill terror in the enemies of Allah and your enemies. Mm. Oh, yeah. This ayah, of course, proves that all Muslims are terrorists and that <laughs> this is not just because we want to be, but because Allah commands us to be. And I want us to, before I actually talk about this ayah, I want us to actually think about this ayah. Because what Allah is actually instructing us to do is put ourselves in position to not have to fight. Did you hear it? Where is that in the eye? Huh? Instill terror. Make them scared. You're not making them scared because you're physically harming them. No. Because they know your potential. They don't want to fight the giant. And so there's peace because we're not going to do anything. We, we can't. Allah has instructed us to lead with justice and, and guidance. You're not going to do any injustice to anyone. The next ayah, Allah has said, sell me. If they turn to peace, then you also turn to peace. Because the issue is not that there's war. The issue is to put ourselves in a position 
where we have what it takes to make them so scared that they don't want to fight. Now, here's the interesting part. Some of the Mufassirin, and from amongst them, Imam Sa'di, rahimahullah ta'ala, from a contemporary standpoint, has a very beautiful uh, lefta here. And he, he's drawing our attention to something. He says, Those people who want to destroy your deen, those people who have rejected Iman, prepare for them what you can of force and strength. He says, al quwa al aqliya wal badaniya wal asliha wa nahwi dalik. Min al quwa al aqliya wal badaniya, both intellectual strength and physical strength, and weapons, arms, and other than that, which will aid you in. Fighting in combat, like intellectual strength. What does that mean? Well, obviously, it means understanding how combat works, being able to strategize, being able to put things in place. But even beyond that, there's jihad with the pen, there's jihad with the tongue, which requires a certain level of intellectual strength. We have to be prepared preparing ourselves to be able to face whatever shubuhat or, or, or doubtful matters that they bring to the table, whatever it is, being prepared academically, intellectually, and otherwise, so that they don't even want to fight. They don't even want to argue. They don't want to debate because we have prepared the idnillah to be able to defeat any enemy that comes. We do have a responsibility as a community to be prepared. And if we cannot prepare in certain ways or those things are out of reach, we can prepare in other ways. And ultimately, ultimately, it's time for the damage. Okay, so they told me I had till 520 in the beginning, didn't they? Maybe I'm wrong. All right, anyway, mashallah, I know that we have to stop, but just to recap, the idnillahi ta'ala, the Ummah walillahi alhamd is upon khair. Allah Azza wa Jal has blessed us. What we see is a test and everybody who says they believe will be tested. That's going to happen. We have become, there, there is some weakness in this Ummah without a doubt. And that weakness corresponds to our love of this dunya. Like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when he, in the hadith of Thoban and he talked about why they're going to gather around us, why they're going to attack, even though we're going to have so many numbers. He said, it's because we've fallen in love with the dunya and we're scared to die. And this is why we do have to switch that mindset. We have to shift.